Hi everybody, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack and Turn. I hope that you're doing well. I hope you're having a great weekend. Uh, after what was certainly for me a very busy week, I do hope everybody's well. Our library tour is continuing and we're heading to a shelf of two. Two writers, uh, for the most part two long-running series, uh, populated by these two main characters. I hesitate to use the word protagonist, certainly with one of them. Uh, but these are series I really enjoy. Uh, I read about one a year from them. My wife really enjoys these. She reads about one a year from them. My father-in-law, uh, different, different family members or friends I have really enjoy one or both of the series. Um, and to such a degree that the first three books from one and the first book from the other series are all out on loan to different friends or family members to be enjoying because uh, th th these are fun to read. They're not necessarily the most edifying books, but they're, they're fun to read. They, they rip. Uh, they'll, they'll be the Parker novels from Richard Stark, a pen name of Donald Westlake, and the Travis McGee novels from John D. MacDonald. So let's talk about Parker first. So Richard Stark is pen name of Donald Westlake. Westlake wrote numerous other crime novels uh, and works, but uh, the Richard Stark series of Parker books is certainly, I, I feel, his strongest book. And he, uh, he has this character, Parker, who's a armed robber, burglar, thief. Uh, generally, it's, the heist is going to involve cash or the score is going to involve cash. Sometimes it is, a, there's a rare coin score, um, diamonds, in the mourner, a statue. Uh, but for the most part, that's just gone. And the books often start with the same word. When the guy with asthma finally came in from the fire escape, Parker rabbit punched him and took his gun away. The asthmatic hit the carpet, but there had been another one out there, and he landed on Parker's back like a duffel bag with arms. Parker fell turning so that the duffel bag would be on the bottom, but it didn't quite work out that way. They landed sideways, joltingly, and the gun skidded away into the darkness at all. There was no light in the room at all. The window was a paler rectangle sliced out of blackness. Parker and the duffel bag wrestled around on the floor a few minutes, neither getting an advantage because the duffel bag wouldn't give up his first hold, but just clung to Parker's back. These books <laughs> basically leap at you <laughs> from the page uh, <laughs> with an energy that is, I find, rarely matched. I don't want to say unmatched, but rarely matched. And that pace keeps up for much of these books. Uh, we are hurtling through plots, through twists. And uh, with it, we have Parker, who is often the smartest person in the room. Uh, but that's not always why he survives. He's also just a survivor. He perseveres. He, he has that Philip Marlowe quality of he's just going to outlast everybody when it really comes down to it. Um, but the, the books can be fascinating. Uh, they can be ridiculous often. Uh, but they, they move very, very quickly. The first three are The Hunter, The Man with the Getaway Face, and The Outfit. Those are on loan. The Hunter is very famous. It was filmed in the 60s as Point Blank with Lee Marvin in the role of this unnamed character, but... Parker, uh, and Angie Dickinson is also in the film. It's great. It's, uh, it's a film that sort of helps kick off what we think of as modern action movies. Um, really, for, for in the 70s and 80s is when those modern action movies start uh, proliferating, I think. But Point Blank is, along with probably Bullet, are two of the book, uh, two of the movies that start sort of push uh, what we can start to expect from an action movie um, in terms of, you know, the physicality, the pace, um, what's going on. So Point Blank, The Hunter is often published even as Point Blank. Um, uh, it deals, all we're introduced to is Parker. Uh, Parker has been hurt. He is now going to try and take revenge. Um, and he will succeed because he's Parker. The second book is The Man with the Getaway Face. Now that Parker has uh, gotten involved in having to kill this one uh, mobster who had been, you know, a member of the outfit. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Parker has to get his uh, get plastic surgery, which was something that was done in the great Midwestern crime wave in the 1930s. Uh, Dillinger um, and some of the Dillinger gang members would have plastic surgery done to try and disguise uh, their face, their faces to a certain degree. So now uh, the man with the getaway face, well, the problem is, is that Parker's new face has been exposed. And so he's off you know, to, to kind of save his own skin. The third book, The Outfit, deals with Parker now unleashing a whole band of criminals on the different outfit-controlled, you know, illegal gambling rooms and thing, uh, things like that, and uh, until he can finally get revenge and get them to stop coming after him. And that's, those, those books all sort of go together as a series. The Hunter's amazing. The other two are good, but The Hunter is amazing. 
But after The Hunter, the books really don't necessarily have to be read in order. Periodically, there will be one that clearly follows another and, and like is picking up plot threads. But many of them are sort of standalone. They just are their own books. The Mourner is a great example of that. There's a murder weapon involved that, from a previous you know murder that uh, Park wants to like make sure doesn't fall into the hands of the police. But for the most part, he's just trying to steal the statue. Um, the Jugger is one of the books that does pick up um, a number of those threads because the Jugger is the guy who would help Parker figure out his cases. This is one of the strongest books. It's, uh, it's eerie. It takes place kind of in a rural Midwestern town where uh, Parker has sort of received a, a note saying like, hey, this, this friend of his, the Jugger, Joe, um, Joe Shear, needs help. And Joe Shear's one of the only guys who can act, who actually knows like who Parker is now that all this other stuff from the early books is done. And so Parker's going to go there and he's going to find that um, some of his tactics are going to be put to the test. Um, between those is the great The Score. It was an impossible crime. Knock off a huge plant payroll, all the banks and all the stores of one entire city in one entire night. But there was one thief good enough to try. That was Parker. So uh, these books were published, um, I want to say in the 80s. Yeah, these editions were published in the 80s, as were these ones. I will say only that the little mass market paperbacks have some of the great covers of all time. Um, we have the seventh. Uh, this is a great one um, where there's seven men. They heist a college football game and then things get scary. Uh, this was filmed with uh, Jim Brown in the Parker role. Donald Sutherland plays one of the uh, bad guys. I want to say Gene Hackman is in the role as a, as a cop, uh, is in the film as a cop. Um, anyways, the seventh is great. It's one of the strongest ones. Uh, the mass market paperback, though, I, I do need to show. That was a gift from my father-in-law. The mass market paperback has Parker with this, like, machine gun. Uh, then, try to move through these. The Handle. This is a cool one involving a, a gambling island out in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, <laughs> great. The Rare Coin Score. Uh, this is the one that on the back says, Parker's last heist was rated triple X. Extra violent, extra sexy, and extra deadly. I was once reading this in public, and I had the book open like this, and somebody saw this, and essentially thought that I was reading an adult novel, you know, at a Chipotle. Uh, the sour, this is a cool sour lemon score and deadly edge. Plunder squad. When you're in Parker's business, you don't get to make many mistakes before you end up a convict or a corpse. And Parker just made two big ones. Um, so these these books are absolute dynamite to read. Uh, the Green Eagle score is a fascinating one. This one takes place at a, uh, a military base um, up in the northern U.S. And this is a really interesting one. The Black Ice score. This one deals with um, the diamonds. Uh, some individuals from Africa. And uh, this is a pretty fascinating one. Then there's Slayground. Slayground uh, is fascinating. So periodically the heist goes wrong and Parker goes off into some space and he is trying to hide out and then gradually he's going to have to like come out of hiding to deal with stuff. For this one, Parker's hiding out in a closed amusement park during the winter. Uh, so it's closed down, you know, for the winter. And so that's where Parker's hiding out. And now people are going to come in uh, and so uh, he's been seen, he was seen by a couple of cops who decide that they're going to come in and, and with some local gangsters and get that, get that cash Parker has all within an amusement park. Um, and so this one's fantastic. Uh, but there are, um, then a couple of those other smaller ones take place in between. And it then comes back to Butcher's Moon and this created sort of a hiatus. So R Westlake was ripping these books off. I mean, even at, a, at a rate greater than one a year that he was really going through these. And then he got to Butcher's Moon in the mid 70s and sort of just stopped for a while. He actually has Parker return to the scene of Slayground and picks up some threads there. And, and there were a couple of books in between. Uh, Plunder Squad, I want to say Deadly Edge, uh, maybe even Sour Lemon Score are in between. But Slayground and Butcher's Moon really reached this crescendo within the Parker books. Uh, 
And Parker then just sort of disappears for a while until come back. Um, and, uh, this one again, we've got, you know, there's a stadium involved and all sorts of good stuff. Backflash, uh, which has, uh, like the handle, uh, there's boats involved. Flash fire, which was filmed as Parker. Uh, so Parker is like basically, you know, left, left for dead by uh, his group. And then, um, you know, the, the, he, he's sort of left by his group, not so much left for dead, just left by his group. Uh, in the film, I believe they have him left for dead. And then they show up again in uh, Palm Beach. And so we get Parker in the Deep South, which is, or Florida, which is equally fascinating. Uh, Fire Break, and then closing out with Dirty Money and Ask the Parrot. Uh, Dirty Money is quite interesting and, and sort of funny. Um, so th those are the Parker books, and I love them. But I also love one of Donald Westlake's other series, and it's one where he wanted to sort of test out a, you know, could he still just get anything published in all of the success he'd had? And so he came out in the mid 80s, he wrote three of them, and with the idea that they were just gonna be published by Sam Holt or Samuel Holt. And yeah, Samuel Holt. And uh, he, you know, he didn't want it, his name associated with it, but of course they published it, and then, you know, underneath it says, from Donald, the new novel from Donald Westlake. So he just didn't want to continue the character. But Sam Holt is a, a character who plays a TV detective uh, <laughs> who suddenly becomes involved in real life crime. And so there's one of us is wrong. I know a trick worth two of that. And what I tell you three times is false. Uh, these books are really really cool. They, they have a very different sensibility from the Parker books. There, there's action, of course, but the, the, uh, the books are not like, <laughs> we, we're not dealing with a career criminal in these books. Um, and, and so there's a very different sensibility with very similar writing, the, the very similar energy of writing to what we find in, in the Parker books. So that's a series I love. Now, the other I mentioned was, of course, the great Travis McGee novels from John D. McDonald. These are famously the color novels, so they all have a color associated with them. Um, it, I, I believe in order to help people remember which ones they had read, like it was sort of almost a built-in mnemonic. Uh, I don't have the Deep Blue Goodbye that's on loan. That introduces us to Parker, who lives on a houseboat in uh, Fort Lauderdale, and who's similar to Parker. Uh, Travis McGee is going to just go recover something for you. Uh, but you're going to pay him half of what he's recovering. And he does that once a year, every other year. And so he's taking his retirement in stages, he says. He goes and does this one job to recover cash, rare coin, whatever. Um, and then he's going to just relax for the next 8 to 14 months before he takes another job. Uh, and what's the, the really delightful part of this series is um, the way that we see McGee's perception of everything changes, similar to the Archer novels from Ross D. MacDonald, which I want to be clear, those have a lot of psychology, though those are very, very different from the John D. MacDonald books. Um, they're different writers, of course. But uh, both of them show us this long running view of a place and of a character in that place and that character's perceptions of all the changes happening. And that's a real delight within the books. But uh, Deep Blue Goodbye is fantastic. It's an absolute dynamite crime novel, one I highly, highly recommend. Uh, Nightmare in Pink is a rare John D. MacDonald book. It takes us into New York City. Uh, most, very few of the books are set in cities. Purple Place for Dying uh, might be one of my favorites, uh, in part because it's out here in the Southwest. Um, and uh, this one, I, I find the plot in this one really works well. It ties together well. I, I think it was sort of, you know, McDonald was figuring out what he wanted to do with McGee and, and he had tried something with Nightmare in Pink and he sort of understood where to where to cha make changes. Um, A Deadly Shade of Gold is the longest. This is an absolutely fascinating book. It takes us over to uh, Baja, California. And so Southern California, Western Mexico, and just it deals with um, anti-Castro Cuban exiles. All sorts of stuff is wrapped up into A Deadly Shade of Gold. It is a fascinating book. Uh, that, that really, I think, expands the world that we think of Travis McGee operating in. The Quick Red Fox is interesting. 
Uh, this is one that deals with uh, McGee hanging out with an actress and um, this, you know, who has these very specific fears. I don't want to give away the plots on these. Uh, but this one, this one's really good. I think my wife uh, puts this one up as like one of her top two or three. Uh, Bright Orange for the Shroud has one of the scariest bad guys in the series so far from what I've read. I, I really do pace myself with these of one a year. Uh, but this one, the, the bad guy in here is absolutely depraved, totally terrifying. Um, this, he, he's almost like a swamp rat in the, the Everglades. And he's horrifying. And then this year it'll be darker than amber. Uh, I do, though, have several others. So one fearful yellow eye. I'm excited to get to this one next year, probably early next year. Uh, just the way my reading uh, uh, plans are, are, are shifting. This one takes place in Chicago. And then pale gray for guilt. Um, which uh, periodically Parker is brought into these. Sometimes people come to Parker. Or, geez, Travis McGee. <laughs> Sometimes people come to McGee um, wanting something specific. Uh, I probably have referred to McGee as Parker multiple times throughout this video. I apologize. <laughs> um, sometimes McGee has people coming to him to try and get this recovery. But in other books, there are old acquaintances of McGee who show up. Um, Bright Orange for the Shroud would be an example of that. Pale Gray for Guilt is an example of that, where the character is showing up from his past and, and it's an old friend of McGee's. It's somebody who, you know, he's he has some tie to and he feels like he, he has enough of a heart that he feels like he's got to get involved. Uh, the Girl in the Plain Brown Wrapper. Um, some of these have little clues on the cover about what the book is going to involve. Dresser and Indigo is also one I'm super excited for because I believe this one takes place in like Central America or uh, Southern Mexico, Oaxaca perhaps. Um, so I'm really excited for that one. And then I do have two of the much later ones, Empty Copper Sea and The Turquoise Lament. So I, I pace myself with uh, Travis McGee. Uh, that's a real pleasure in my reading. So the, this was uh, another shelf on our library tour. And I, we'll, see, we'll see what we have next week. I doubt it's going to be more crime fiction. Huh? I'm not sure where we're going, though. Hope everybody's well. Thanks.